So, the first noble truth of the Socratic tradition is that we can um, know ourselves. So to explore this idea, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I got into philosophy and how it helped me through what was the most difficult phase of my life. Um, so when I was a, a teenager in the 1990s, um, my friends and I were, I guess you could say, we were like amateur uh, neuroscientists. So we like to experiment on our own brains with various different chemicals uh, every weekend. And so we you know, began our experiments with marijuana, which was fascinating, and then we tried experimenting with LSD, and then we also threw in MDMA and magic mushrooms and all these kind of different things, like ingredients into a druid's cauldron. And we had some great times, but then I noticed some of my friends beginning to uh, wipe out. So fr raver friends of mine developed um, bipolar disorder, paranoia, depression, my best friend was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. And I saw this kind of my friends falling one by one. And then it hit me too in my first term at university. So I started to get um, panic attacks. I had no idea what a panic attack was then. I just knew I'd be in situations which wasn't objectively life-threatening. But that's how I felt. I feel this kind of deep sense of mortal terror. So that undermined my, um, my confidence because I didn't know who I'd be from one moment to the next, and it also made me more socially anxious, because I was never sure when panic was going to jump out. And my real fear was that I'd done some permanent damage to the kind of chemical balance in my brain, the dopamine or serotonin or whatever, in which case maybe there was nothing I could do about it. Maybe I'd permanently damaged myself, you know, ruined my life before the age of 21, so that was my real fear. And I didn't really talk to anyone about it, all the way through university, I just got more, so I was afraid and ashamed of being wounded. So I just got more and more miserable, and finally I graduated, and I hit rock bottom. I became a financial journalist. <laughs> I got a job reporting on the German mortgage bond market, a cautionary tale of what happens if you mess around with drugs. Uh, and I just kept looking around for cures. Uh, my parents, were very kind and loving, paid for me to go and see an expensive therapist at the Priory, if any of you have heard of that. And this expensive therapist diagnosed me as suffering from depression, social anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder. I think he was being paid per diagnosis. <laughs> bump the pack. And he wasn't able to heal me, unfortunately. But I went away and I researched these conditions on the internet. And I discovered that they could apparently be treated by something called cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. So, and I also found there was a CBT support group for people who suffer from social anxiety that met every Thursday evening in the Royal Festival Hall. Not on the stage, but in one of the kind of public areas. So one Thursday evening, I went along, and there was 10 people sitting in a circle, much like you are. There was no therapist present, but one of the people had bootlegged a CBT course for social anxiety from the internet, called Overcoming Social Anxiety Step by Step, by the way. Uh, and we, so we followed this course, and we did the handouts and did the exercises and encouraged each other on over about three months. And for me, at least, it worked. Um, I stopped having panic attacks after a few weeks, and I started to understand how I could transform my emotions. So I became fascinated by this therapy, which I felt had pretty much saved my life, CBT. And I wanted to know who had invented it, where had it come from. So I was a freelance journalist by that point, so I started to research it. And I discovered it had been invented by an American psychologist called Albert Ellis. So one day in 2007, I got on a plane to New York, and I went to interview Albert Ellis. By that point, he was 92, old and frail and sick, in hospital, in fact. And um, it turned out to be the last interview he gave before he died a few months later. But I got to thank this man, Albert Ellis, for having invented this therapy, which had helped me so much. And I asked him, where did it come from? Where did, where did you get this great idea of CBT from? And Ellis had trained as a psychoanalyst in Freudian psychoanalysis in the 50s, but he felt his patients weren't making much progress. So he'd looked around for other ways to understand emotions and how we can change them. And he turned back to his first great love, which was ancient Greek philosophy. He was particularly inspired by a quote from a Stoic philosopher called Epictetus, who lived in the first century AD in Rome. Epictetus said, men are disturbed not by events, but by their opinion about events. That line uh, switched the light bulb on in Ellis' head and inspired the whole cognitive revolution in therapy. And inspired in particular, Ellis' famous ABC theory of the emotions. Um, I'll write it down, I don't know why, but my graphics are good. Um, so A stands for the activating event, something that happens to us. B stands for the beliefs that we interpret that event through. And C stands for the consequent emotion that we feel through our interpretation. Often it feels like our emotions just happen to us involuntarily and automatically, as an automatic reaction to an event. 
For example, we're walking down the street and we pass someone and they're frowning and we feel offended and insulted and angry. And if someone asks us, why are you in such a bad mood? You say, well, that, this person frowned at me in the street. They gave me a dirty look. It seems like you go straight from A, the person frowning, to C, the event. There's just an action and a reaction. But if you look at that event closely, what actually happens is you interpreted that event a certain way. You thought, perhaps, that person's frowning at me. They're looking down at me in some way. They're, they're, you know, they're making a judgment of me. And then you think, how dare they? How offensive? How rude? Where did they get off being so judgmental? And so it was your interpretation that led to your emotion of feeling offended and insulted and put down. Once you realize how your interpretations and belief cause your emotions, then you can take that bit and hold it up to the light, hold up your interpretations to the light, and ask, is that definitely accurate? or true, or wise? Are there other ways I could see that situation? For example, you could say, was that person definitely frowning at me? Maybe they were just frowning. Maybe that's their kind of resting expression. And if they were definitely frowning at me, so what? Do I have to then feel offended and insulted and angry and take that bad mood with me for the rest of the day? Maybe I can just shrug and go, so what? In other words, when we begin to become aware of the role of our beliefs and opinions in our feelings, we begin to get some control over how we feel. Once an emotion starts, of course, it kind of gets out of control. It's a full-body thing. But we have some control over this bit, our perceptions, beliefs, our interpretations, which means we can change and modulate how we feel. Now, that might sound quite nice and simplistic. Unfortunately, it's not quite that simple, because often our beliefs, our opinions, and our interpretations are unconscious and unexamined. Um, as Socrates put it, we sleepwalk through life. We're not always aware of how we interpret the events around us. We have a kind of running commentary going on in our head all through the day, an inner voice, making constant interpretations and judgments of all the things that are happening to us. And usually, we don't really notice that inner voice, because it's happening slightly below our consciousness. And we certainly don't question it. We assume that it's 100% accurate and true. The problem is that often it isn't. Our minds often misread situations. That inner voice often gets things wrong. That inner voice is kind of made up of all the ideas and beliefs and opinions we've heard since we were babies. And then we've kind of internalized the inner voice. And we just assume that it's true. We grant that inner voice kind of divine status in it. You know, it's absolute, it's absolute in its judgments. You could think of that inner voice, that running commentary, as kind of like a, a news channel. Think of it as like Fox News, constantly making judgments about the things that happen to you, but in a very distorted way. It's a kind of lazy uh, judge. It never really checks its facts. And if you have emotional problems, um, that's probably because your inner voice is jumping to very negative assumptions and conclusions. If you're depressed, you might automatically assume that other people don't like you. Or you might automatically assume that the things you do in life are going to fail. And you don't really question those assumptions. You take them as absolutely true. So according to the Greeks then, what often causes us suffering is not just the world, but also how we think about the world, our own beliefs. We are our own torturers often, our own imprisoners. We cling to our toxic or negative beliefs even when they cause us suffering, even when they kill us. So how do we learn then to be doctors to ourselves? Well, According to Socrates, the first step is to learn to ask yourself questions, to engage that automatic inner voice in a rational dialogue and say, is that definitely true? Is that definitely accurate? Is that definitely wise? Then you begin to take your unexamined, inherited, unconscious beliefs and opinions and hold it up to the light and say, is that, is that definitely a good way of looking at it? That's how you start to begin to be the doctor to yourself, examining all these beliefs that you're swallowing and asking if they're definitely good for you. And that's pretty much what happens in a session of CBT as well. Rather than lying on a couch and delivering a monologue for several years about how awful your parents were to you, you sit up and engage in a dialogue with the, with the therapist. It's called the Socratic method in CBT. And, they'll, and you come in and you say, God, everyone hates me at work. And they'll say, is that definitely true? Everyone? Is that a bit of a generalization maybe? There's some people you get on with. You know, what could you do about it? What are the practical steps to get you to start thinking rationally about those powerful you know, very strongly held beliefs you, um, you have. So that's the first noble truth of the Socratic tradition. Quick sip. <laughs>